Hello and welcome to UTS Library's video on using EndNote 20 for Mac. Today, in this half hour or so session, we will take you through uh, where to find EndNote 20 for Mac on the library website and then how to use uh, it. So we'll take you through the layout of the software, how to put references into EndNote 20 and then how to use EndNote 20 with Word. So let's get cracking. First thing I'm going to do is share my screen. And let us now travel away from Zoom and menu log to the library website. I think I need to load this one. Here we go. Okay, so um, EndNote 20 is free to UTS staff and students um, via the library website. So first thing you need to do is go to the library website, which is lib.uts.edu.au. And then when you get there, mouse over this referencing heading and then from there travel down to EndNote. Scroll down a little bit and you'll see EndNote 20, well, download EndNote for Mac. And after you click on that and sign in, I'll just make sure I have my most recent password in here. You'll come to this page and then you can click on EndNote 20 from there and download the site installer. Unlike previous versions of EndNote for Mac, it seems like you need to unzip this file once it goes into your downloads folder before you can then run the install wizard. Uh, on my Mac, there's a function called archive utility that does this. So we do have a video all about that uh, as well that you can find in our EndNote playlist on YouTube. So I'll just leave the uh, sort of downloading information there. Okay. So once you've downloaded it all and uh, you start up a library, you will see something like this. What I'll do before I um, begin here is just start completely from scratch and make a new library. So uh, EndNote 20 now is in our applications folder. When we run it, uh, we can do file new, give our library a name. I'll call this one Thursday because it's Thursday. Maybe place it in my uh, documents folder and save away. And here we are. So I'll just maximize this screen. Um, sometimes when you fully maximize it using this green button, it will um, sort of get rid of the uh, tabs up here. So I might just sort of stretch the screen out to avoid that happening. Okay, it's uh, probably actually unlikely that we'll be using these tabs, but still I'm used to seeing them. Okay, so here we are uh, looking at EndNote 20. You can see that the colors are a little bit different to previous editions. It's got a sort of dark motif around the edge here. There are some other differences to uh, the layout of EndNote 20. So I'll try and point them out uh, as we go for users of previous editions of EndNote. But basically there's three panels that constitute the uh, layout here. We've got a filing system on the left, um, underneath of which is a couple of other functions that we won't uh, play with today, but I'll just tell you about the find full text function, which will um, sort of search the library's catalog of holdings for full text PDFs that accompany your references in an automated process. Then there's online search modes, uh, most of which aren't terribly useful um, to use in this way from within EndNote. It is possible that if you are doing a systematic review, you might be able to use PubMed um, from within EndNote for the purpose of downloading huge amounts of records at once. But aside from that, probably wouldn't come up very much and won't be in the video today. Then we have uh, the middle part of the screen, which is where the references live. Um, we don't have any references right now, but as we create them, they will go there. You will also notice above this sort of area where the references live, um, some uh, I guess uh, icons here and then a search mode. So this is a little bit different to previous versions of EndNote. Um, in previous versions of EndNote, there were more icons and they sort of lived above uh, these three panels here. Um, they've been simplified and reduced in this mode, uh, in this version, EndNote 20. And now what we're left with is a new reference, which we'll use later, share a library or a group, which um, again, isn't really part of the purview of this class, but uh, can be useful. Uh, export references, which you would use potentially if you wanted to um, 
get your library into another piece of referencing software, for example, and maybe some other things too, but we won't do that today. Um, search the web for full text documents, which is, I believe, the same kind of thing as this. And finally, make a web of science citation report for the references in your library. All of these are sort of more advanced researchy uh, type things. So we will uh, leave that for another day. You will also notice uh, above this references area that there's a search mode. So the search mode existed in previous versions of EndNote, but wasn't um, always there as a default. You could sort of turn it on and off, whereas in uh, EndNote 20, it's always there. Now, the little picture in picture window here, I believe will all, always be hanging over this area in the finished video, which is a bit frustrating. But um, even if I try and move it like in the recording part of things, but basically this uh, third window is a preview window. Uh, and within the preview window in the top right, potentially underneath my image, are two tabs, one saying summary and one saying edit. And when you have a reference, um, you will be able to use this preview window to um, see the fields within that reference, such as, you know, the author and the title and things like that, and also to change uh, the information in there or add to it if you want to using the edit function. The summary window will um, show you a preview of the reference according to your favorite referencing style um, and also will uh, show you any uh, PDF attachments that you might have um, put alongside a reference. So we'll show you all of that in the class today. Okay, so now that we've sort of gone over some of these uh, differences, oh, I guess I'll just add that this preview area is also a little bit different from uh, previous versions of EndNote in that in the past there were three tabs, um, now there are two, and the, the third tab was the PDF attachment tab, which is now sort of built into summary. A final difference, I guess, in the cosmetic layout of EndNote 20 is that there's no um, option to reconfigure these windows. Uh, in previous versions, you could have this preview window appear along the bottom of the screen, uh, whereas now it's sort of fixed in place. Okay. But apart from that, I think a lot of the um, things that we'll do today will be very familiar to a uh, EndNote 19 or earlier user. All right. So um, what are we going to do first here? We're going to go and grab a referencing style off the UTS library website. So um, one of the most commonly used styles in um, the University of Technology, Sydney, is the APA 7th style. Um, this style actually comes as a default style within EndNote 20, but the library has gone and taken that style and improved it in uh, some ways so that for pretty much any reference type out there, you can create a perfect APA reference um, using this sort of slightly modified APA slash UTS style. So I will download that style to my computer today and show you how to do that. So to grab our um, improved version of the APA 7th style, go to the library website and go over the referencing tab and down to EndNote again. And then scroll down until you see this little APA 7th link and click on that. It will send something to your downloads folder. And when you click on this download, EndNote will open and you'll see this page. So these are all the rules that define the APA 7th UTS style. To save it to EndNote, go up to file. Oh, so I did need these tabs. And choose save as and give it a name. So APA 7th UTS is fine. I can take away some of this extraneous information and then press save. And I already had this style, so I'll have to replace it. But you may not have to. When all of that is done, I can just shut this window down. And now I can choose APA 7th UTS as my favorite referencing style. This is a little bit different to previous editions of EndNote as well. To, to choose your favorite style, you go up to tools and then output styles, and then you open the style manager. So I'll do that. And then within this A to Z list of styles, you will see um, APA 7th UTS living there and you can check the little box beside it and then press choose, I guess, would be the, uh, the option. I've already selected it. So instead of giving me the option to choose, uh, it says edit. So um, let me just see if I choose a different one. Yeah, you basically just tick the ones that you like actually, and then you can close the window. The, the choose button is gone. 
So basically you put a check mark next to the style you'd like to add to your favorites and then just shut this window down. Okie dokie. So um, what are we gonna do now? We are going to add a book from the library catalog to EndNote. So if I go back to um, library website and I search for a book, I'm gonna look for the book Sapiens, which I'm currently reading. Apologies for the breathy sound of my uh, Mac here. So uh, underneath some results aren't, which aren't actually the book Sapiens, here is the actual thing. Uh, if I click on it, a new page will open eventually, I think. Well, it wasn't really playing along there, so I'll do it this way. Uh, if you go and click on these triple dots over here, this will also give you the option to export to EndNote. Um, go and uh, click those three dots and then choose this export RIS option. And then press download. Uh, another thing will go down into your downloads folder. And when you click that, you'll see this reference appear in your EndNote library. If that doesn't work, there's a video on our EndNote playlist that will show you how to um, configure your Mac so that it automatically opens in EndNote. Okay, so um, what are we seeing here? Over on the right, we have um, information that's come down from the library catalog in the summary mode. And in the edit mode, we have um, the innards of the reference. It's always good to double check a reference that's come down from the internet um, because sometimes it's incomplete or imperfect in some way. And one obvious thing I can see about this record is that for some reason, the author's name, Harari, has come down twice. So if I find something like this that I think is wrong, I can just edit it uh, in this edit mode and then press this little save button, which again might be hidden behind my face, but is just up here, a little blue button that says save. Okay. Now, um, what you will also see at the very bottom of the summary page, and for me, it's kind of hidden by some of these other things that are on my screen, but uh, there is a little window down here saying select another style. Sometimes you can configure this window to bring it up a little bit. Um, here we go. So maybe that's easier for you to see now. So if I use this select another style thing, I can go down and choose APA 7 CTS and it will now format that reference according to that style. Let's have a quick look at this reference and see if there's anything else about it we might like to tidy up. We've got uh, author names here, which look fine for APA 7th. We've got a, a year in parentheses, which is fine. We have a title. We have some addition information here and we have the publisher. So this is very close to being a perfect reference as far as I can see. The one thing about it I might change is this first Harper perennial edition ed bit. Generally, um, this field in APA 7th is for second and subsequent editions of a book. You don't usually have to mention a first edition in here. So I might just go into edit mode, find that information, which is down here in edition, and get rid of that as well. So it always pays to know a little bit about the style you're referencing with. Before you pick up EndNote, um, it will make your uh, EndNote experience a more efficient and pleasurable one. There you go, so I've saved that. And now um, if I go back over to the summary, oh, I might also have to click out of here and click back again. Yes, so now all that information has gone. Sometimes EndNote won't um, immediately reflect the changes you've made unless you click sort of out of this reference and then go back in. So just something to bear in mind. Okay, so uh, we'll just continue gathering up a couple of references now. Uh, I might go to a uh, academic database and repeat this process one more time, just to give you a feel for how it works. Um, this is the Science Direct database, which I've chosen because it has lots of full text PDFs in it. And will let me show you how to attach a PDF to a reference. I'm gonna continue the sort of hominid type searching that I uh, started with the Sapiens book. And this time I'll look for Homo ergaster. Okie dokie. So um, here we have uh, the social organ organization of Homo ergaster and other articles about the same. So if I go and grab one, you can grab more than one, if you like, by checking more than one box. 
Um, different dat databases have different sort of maximum amounts you can export, but um, they would all allow you to export at least several dozen, if not uh, more than 100 at a time, if you wanted to. I'll just e export these two. So uh, you check the boxes and then you look for a button that says export, which in ScienceDirect is very easy to find. In some databases, this um, procedure might be slightly different, but again, we've got videos on our YouTube um, EndNote playlist that covers exporting from lots of different databases if your experience varies. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to export to RIS again, which is the EndNote compatible file type, and then click on this little download window and two references should appear. And here they are, the Pearson and the Willems. What I'll do is I'll also go and get a PDF attachment for one of these and um, show you how to bring that into EndNote as well. So for the Willems, um, I'll click download PDF. And download the PDF. You have to download it before you can attach it. So download it there. This is going into my downloads. It has this name. Sometimes it's a nice idea to um, give it a more comprehensible name. So I'll do that. And then I can go back over to EndNote and attach this file. So this was the Willems. If I click on that and go up here, you'll see this attach file option. Click that. And then I have to find my, um, my reference, which is a bit hard to track down. So I might have to search my thing. Ah, oh, here we go. Willems Homo Ergaster. And double click. So, uh, Unlike previous versions of EndNote, it doesn't immediately default to showing you a little preview of um, the PDF in EndNote, but it is there. It's actually up here uh, uh, in this little drop-down window. So if I was to um, use this little drop-down and choose open, there is the PDF. And it has a couple of little tools that come along with the, uh, the viewer. You've got a search mode, a note-making mode, and a print mode, and probably one or two other things too, but they seem to be the most salient options within that um, PDF viewer. So there we go. Notice again, when I click out of where it says Willems, it says, do you want to save these changes? And that's referring to um, saving the PDF to the reference. So I'll click save. Pardon me. So uh, we're making good time here. Um, I'm just going to show you one more export option, which is Google Scholar. And then we will, um, move on. So Google Scholar is obviously a very useful um, research tool. There is a kind of weird quirk though about um, Google Scholar, at least the way it works right now. And that is that um, the citation method to get things into EndNote is a little bit counterintuitive. I'll show you what I mean. So if I go down to hominids foraging in a complex landscape, um, the way you would send this to EndNote is to click this site button. And you would think that the next point um, would be to click EndNote. But it, worked, it turns out lately that clicking RefMan is a better option, simply because the data quality uh, tends to be a little bit higher. Um, if you click EndNote, sometimes the information goes to the wrong fields and there's just more tidy up required on your end. So we'll click RefMan instead, which is also an RIS file type. And when I click on that, we will see this fellow now. Now, I don't really know the provenance of this uh, reference that I chose at random here. Oh, it's some sort of um, conference paper type thing, which is quite a, kind of a complicated um, little reference to enter in, I suppose. But you can see here we've got um, some information here that I could potentially copy because I believe not all of it went into EndNote. So even though we used the RefMan option, it wasn't perfect. But if I went over here to edit, oh, it actually comes down as a conference proceedings, which is quite nice. Um, well, you might just need to tidy up some of this stuff. So, I mean, I'm not an expert in freestyling uh, a conference paper. But uh, I assume maybe this alternate title thing, which I'm having a darn time copying right now, would probably be better in conference name, for example. 
and so on and so forth. So maybe if I just do this, it will improve the reference some. So uh, I won't waste a huge amount of time trying to turn this into a perfect conference paper reference. It might require a bit of trial and error on my end. But um, if I now go and look down at the uh, citation here, we can see what we do have. And basically you need to play around with that a little bit until it gets better. Um, I wonder if conference paper would be better. This is kind of like neither here nor there, but I will just have a quick look at this and see if conference paper is better. Ah, there you go. So I did play around with it a little bit. Now you've got the name of the Congress uh, and the, the location. Um, better than nothing. Perhaps it was getting better and I just didn't click out and click back to see the changes. Any old how. Um, that's how you get a reference out of Google Scholar with probably the most reliability is to use that ref man option. Sorry to waste your time with all that conference paper stuff. Uh, okay, so now we move on to our final little piece of the puzzle which is to enter a reference manually. Pardon me. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is go to Google and uh, find a, a web page that I often use in these demonstrations. Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs from Simply Psychology. So this I am a little bit more familiar with uh, keying in, so I should be able to do a good job of it, unlike a conference paper. Um, basically, you use this uh, new reference button, select the reference type that's most appropriate for what you're going to enter, which is a web page in this case. And then you fill out the uh, main fields that would be required, which are author, year, title, publisher, and URL. Um, so I, I was just quietly cutting and pasting the URL in the background there. So I will paste that in. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the name of the page. So I will go and um, put that in there. It's possible that I would want to decapitalize those letters. Uh, APA seventh usually doesn't want all those letters capitalized. It's possible that sort of theory would capitalize all of its letters. I'm not sure. I would research this more diligently if I was actually using this in assignment. Um, the date of creation is uh, December 29, 2020. So at the very least, you'd want to put in 2020. APA 7th does allow you to put in the date, um, which would actually go in this field, last update date. But if you didn't put that in, it probably wouldn't be a deal breaker. The publisher is the name of the website, which is simply psychology. So I'll pop that in. And finally, the author. So the author's name is Saul McLeod. You can enter an author's name in two different ways. You can write it like this, or you can write it like this. Um, it is important to note that, you know, for every author you're entering in to enter them in on a new line. Uh, as a final consideration, if your author happens to be a corporate entity, like say the, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, you need to enter their name in in this way. Why did I choose such a hard thing to write out? You need to put a little comma at the end because otherwise, uh, when it see I've written Saul McLeod just in a normal way, it will go and take that and make it McLeod comma S. And if you write Australian Bureau of Statistics in the same way, it will manipulate the, the, the name in the same way. It'll make it statistics comma ABO. But if you put a little comma at the end, um, it, it won't do that. It'll just write Australian Bureau of Statistics as the author. So even though they're not the author of this page, I'll just quickly show you how that works. So I'll shut this down and press save. And now if we go down here to this preview, you can see McLeod S and Australian Bureau of Statistics 2020, December 29, author, title of web page and URL. And then again, if I was like, well, hang on, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has got nothing to do with this, you can go into edit 
take it away, save, and then go back and look at it uh, in summary mode and your changes will be affected. Okay, so we're making good time. Uh, let's do a little search of our references and then use that search to build a group. And then we'll start to play around with Word. My poor nose is running all the time today. Uh, I just need to give it a little wipe and away we go. Okay, so uh, if I go up here now into my little filing area and choose all references, we'll see all of the different things that have um, been added to our reference today. And you can actually scroll this left and right. So to see everything. And you can also actually drag this and change the dimensions of the, the windows somewhat. Let's say um, I wanted to uh, make a group uh, and divide my references between Homo sapiens and Homo ergaster. So if I went over to uh, my groups, I could choose create a group. And generally this is what the groups are for. They're for subdividing your uh, reference library into smaller bits. Um, people generally have one EndNote library for all of their sort of academic needs and then they use groups to divide them up because um, it's just a little bit of an easier workflow than having lots of different reference libraries. So that's why groups exist, I suppose. Uh, so I'll create a group called Homo sapiens. And I'll also create another group called Homo ergaster. Great. So now if I go back to all references and I search, I can look for the word sapiens. And there's two things that match. So the reason these match is because the word sapiens is somewhere in that reference. In this book, it's in the title, but in this one, it would be somewhere else in the sort of uh, abstract or notes about the, uh, the work, presumably. So if I wanted to move these two to the sapiens list, you can select them both, control A or shift select and drag them over to sapiens. Then if I wanted to repeat this process with Homo ergaster, you can do the same thing, um, select them. And as an alternate way to put them into your group, you can right click and then do add references to and choose that way as well. Can be a bit easier if you're using a sort of big chunk of references and it's a bit hard to drag them around. So now we have the group here and the group here. Great. So uh, let us now play with Word. So, a new wrinkle in the way EndNote 20 works is that uh, the toolbar that gets downloaded to EndNote, sorry, to Word, um, relies upon you opening EndNote before you open Word. So if you open Word and then you open EndNote, the toolbar may not be visible. So just try re, uh, you know, sort of reopening, uh, well, try opening EndNote 20 first, shutting down Word and reopening it and see if the, uh, the toolbar appears. And if it doesn't, let the library know. We can help you out with that. But here it is, uh, the EndNote 20 toolbar, which is very similar to in previous years. The normal workflow that you would create, I guess, is you know you would write about um, whatever you were writing about. And then when you wanted to insert your, um, your references, you'd go up here and press this little magnifying glass, which provides for you a search function. And here's one I did earlier uh, for Ergaster. So um, you could look up a reference via the author's name or a word in the title or a word that appears anywhere in that reference. And then you can select one or more than one references to be placed within the same citation. APA 7th is a uh, author date style. So when we grab two references, say um, these two, Um, they will be placed next to each other uh, within the same set of uh, round parentheses separated by a semicolon. So let's do that. There you go. So you get the two uh, in-text references. Janssen et al is missing a year. I think that's actually because this Janssen et al one, huh, that's weird. Oh, well, um, it's because my you know, conference paper reference was a bit wacky. So I'd have to tidy that up a bit. But anyway, uh, the second one's looking quite nice. It's got a year in it and everything. Um, okay. Oh, I might just change this to the, the APA 7th style I was using before. So up here in this style window, um, all of your favorite styles. Uh, for some reason, I had the hanging indent version uh, of APA 7th. So 
this is the, the one I downloaded earlier. Okay, and then, you know, I guess the other way that you enter references is uh, in a narrative citation way. So you could say, you know, Willems and Van Shaik say, quote, and then at that point, you would, you know, be referencing Willems but you wouldn't want to reference the, the names in the in-text citation because you've already done that. So if I go up here and I write Willems, even though it's already there, uh, and insert this reference, what EndNote will let you do is um, take these authors out of the in-text citation, if you like. So to do that, you click on the little in-text citation, press edit and manage, and then you can use this dropdown to exclude the author. That way you get the year, but you know, you retain your reference list entry. Um, you, when you're quoting, you would also probably want to put a page number in if it was available and edit and manage citations lets you do that too. So if my quote was from page seven, I put it down there in pages and there you go. A final thing to tell you about um, edit and manage citations is you can remove a citation in this way. And that can be useful, especially if you've got two citations within the same set of parentheses, because um, if you delete that, you'll delete both authors. Um, it's also a good idea to use uh, the edit and manage citation function to remove an author from an in-text citation because it ensures that no spare formatting, this gray text indicates formatting, when you, uh, you know, manually delete something by sort of highlighting it and pressing delete, some of the formatting might be left behind, which will possibly cause uh, formatting errors in your document that are really scary looking. So to avoid that, if you want to remove a citation, go up to edit and manage and say I wanted to remove Janssen, uh, just use this little drop down to choose remove citation. There you go. It, that does mean now we've only got one reference in our reference list, but that's neither here nor there. And um, that's a lot of what I was going to tell you today. If I, um, I'll just tell you two other really quick things. If I wanted a reference list that was not using this coding, um, that was just plain text, you can do that. It won't create in-text references if you use this method, but it will create a reference list. So you highlight all the references you want to make into a reference list, right click, and choose copy formatted. And it will output these references in plain text into your document according to whatever is your favorite style. So if I now go back to Word and paste, you get a reference list like that. You can see the, the text is a little bit different uh, font and stuff and size, but it's all configurable in Word because it's all just plain text, okay? Another thing you can do uh, is you can actually turn the document that you're working on here into plain text. Uh, it could well be that, you know, one of the, say with our um, Pearson reference, that uh, we couldn't find a way to get the year in there. Um, you can sort of edit your document so that it is in there uh, by turning it into plain text. And then you can sort of basically do whatever you like with it. So if we were like, oh, Oh, that must be a different reference. Anyway, let's say um, I wanted to add, you know, volume and issue number to this reference or something, but I just couldn't do it with EndNote. I couldn't make it happen. And one way you can do that is to um, use this tools option to convert to plain text. And that will take all of this uh, EndNote coded stuff and just make it plain text as well. So you have to kind of save the document you're working on because I believe it makes a new document. And here's the plain text version. So um, if I wanted to, you know, then sort of write some volume and issue numbers in here, you could. And I believe actually this one's a, a preprint, so that's why it doesn't have them, but you know, if you wanted to edit that, you could. Whereas if you were doing this in a version that was not plain text, um, it wouldn't let you do that. It would just undo whatever changes you made. So um, four questions about how to key in a reference manually into EndNote or anything else that's a little bit hard to understand from this video. 
um, do come to the library website and ask us a question. If I go back here uh, to the library website, there's a, there's a chat service on the right hand side of the library's homepage, which will sort of bounce out as soon as you reach there. Hit that and um, ask us a question. If it's really, really hard, they will transfer this question into a sort of email consultation with a EndNote librarian like myself. Okay. Well, uh, apologies for various little technical hiccups and uh, other things like that today, me not knowing how to reference a conference paper on the fly, but hopefully this has been uh, useful to you. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you again soon.